What's going on, everyone? Welcome back. Today, we're going to be talking everything you need to know on how to dominate your 2024 fantasy football auction draft. So make sure to tune in. If you enjoy, hit that like button, subscribe, give us a follow on Twitter at All Day Pigskin to continue interacting with us there. Let us hear it in the comments section. Do you agree, disagree with these tips? Uh, along with any other auction draft questions you guys might have, we'll do our best to answer them all. But with that being said, let's get right into it. And as you can see, I've pulled up a uh, auction draft simulator here on Fantasy Pros because I think it's going to help illustrate the points as we discuss them. And let me resume it now. You know, it's a 12 team uh, full PPR format, but that doesn't really matter too much. This is, again, more so for illustration purposes as we discuss. But look, with that being said, let's get right into it. Um, I'm going to start talking with what I believe are the most important uh, pieces of information you need to know first. And that is the different strategies that you can employ in an auction draft. I always uh, categorize it into three different uh, possibilities, either a aggressive strategy, a balanced strategy, or a conservative strategy. So what are each of these three strategies and when should you employ them? No problem. Let's start with the aggressive strategy. As you might expect, this is a strategy where you're going to be spending more money likely earlier on and, you know, kind of throwing a little bit of caution to the wind because you want to get multiple top tier players. Now, look, every single auction draft you do will be different. So all of these tips we're going to talk are going to be interconnected, um, but you need to track uh, and get a feel of how the draft itself is going because certain times, you know, certain players, like in this case, Christian McCaffrey is going to go for a lot of money, 70 bucks. Uh, maybe there's going to be some pretty good values on certain wide receivers. Uh, again, every single auction draft has its own flavor, um, but being able to know what strategy you are going to go in uh, to an auction draft with beforehand is very, very advantageous. Uh, it's not like a snake draft where, you know, a lot of times there I say, you don't want to go in uh, with a set strategy that you're going to live by, live and die by, uh, because the issue there is, well, what happens if that certain player is not available for you? What happens if you're dead set on set uh, on drafting a running back in the first round, but all the top tier guys are already off the board. So what are you going to do? You're just going to reach for the next uh, tier to running back? No, you should go for the best player available. But in an auction draft, it is a little bit different. So I do want to stress that. And again, that's why we're talking strategies first, because knowing which strategy you're going to go into an auction draft with does make a difference. Now, let's get back to the aggressive strategy. Like I said, this is, I would say, akin to drafting multiple first round talents. So basically that's the beauty of the uh, of the auction draft, right? If you really want, you can land a Christian McCaffrey and a Bijan uh, where in a snake draft that would never be possible. But in an auction draft, if you so choose to, you can do it. The question is, you know, how is the rest of the roster going to look uh, afterwards? So if you're aggressive, you're going to drop a uh, draft uh, probably multiple uh, round one type of talents if you equate it to a snake draft. And then, you know, there's a little bit of an inflection point. You're going to have to start being patient. It's probably going to take some time afterwards until your next, uh, your next pick because you might be priced out uh, of the first cup or of the next couple of, um, you know, selections, nominations, things of that nature. So uh, you do have to keep an eye out for that. Now, the downside with aggressive is obviously being way too aggressive because, you know, if you come out of the draft and you draft three players uh, that are like, uh, you know, Brees Hall, Bijan, and then uh, Justin Jefferson, and then you have like $20 left for the rest of your 12 roster spots, then we're going to be in trouble. So um, there's too much of a good thing. Now, even though I would say the more successful rosters by experience, let me stress this, by experienced auction drafters are probably those that sway a little bit aggressive because, you know, uh, history has shown that you probably do need to be, uh, uh, you do need multiple 
uh, top tier talents in order to uh, really have a good chance of making a far run in the playoffs and in things like that. Um, but that's why that aggressive strategy kind of lends itself to that. Let's move on to the second strategy here, though, and that would be a balanced strategy. So with the balanced strategy, basically what you're doing is, again, if I equate it to a snake draft, you're selecting uh, a round one guy, a round two, a round three, a round four, et cetera, and et cetera. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not a situation where you're overpaying a lot, where you're being too conservative and you're waiting too much. Uh, you're kind of right in that sweet spot. Um, so I, that's usually the strategy that I recommend to a lot of people that are beginners because, you know, it's the easiest kind of strategy. It's the, it's the strategy that kind of comes most natural to a lot of people that are first getting into it. Uh, then the last strategy is the conservative strategy. Now, this is a strategy that some people do employ, but there are, again, drawbacks to it as well because, Typically, if you're being conservative, you're waiting for most of the upper echelon type of talent to already have been selected, and then you're grabbing like multiple tier two guys, round two, round three types of talents. Uh, now, the good thing is you're going to have a really, really good bench, a really deep roster, things like that, but then you're going to run into some other issues like the, the issues of, oh, which player do I play when, you know, who's the best choice to make, things of that nature, and there might be a log jam on your bench where uh, there's a lot of similarly uh, kind of producing guys, but there's no one alpha where you're just going to start no matter what type of situation. And I think that's one of those uh, that's one of those deals where uh, you can run into trouble. Now, again, you're going to be deeper. You, you might have the possibility of uh, being able to run a lot of trades once the draft is over because you have so much talent, so much depth, uh, and you will be running the nomination and bidding process later on in the draft. But uh, being a little too conservative uh, is is a strategy that I, I tell people to probably stay away from because you can fall, uh, fall out of uh, your competition uh, pretty quickly there. If, if you notice that everyone has an upper echelon player and you don't, you're going to be playing catch up for the majority of the season. Now, when it comes to these three different strategies, I mentioned it before, it's important to know which strategy you go into your draft with. And the reason I say that is because it is really hard switching in between strategies during your draft. Now, if you're an experienced drafter, then, you know, maybe it's possible. Um, and that's why I always say the balance strategy is typically a good strategy to employ, because if there's one strategy that kind of allows you flexibility to go in between all three, it's that one. So keep that in mind. But like, look, if you start out really aggressive, and then you're like, all right, well, I want to be balanced, that that's not going to happen. Um, that's just not the way it works when it comes to your fund management. Um, again, if you're somebody that's very experienced, then it's a little bit different. You have a little bit more flexibility. You can let the draft come to you and kind of judge it as you go, uh, live, but otherwise it, it is a little bit more difficult. That's why I say you want to go in, uh, with a set type of strategy. But now that we're done talking about strategies, let's talk about the nomination process. And here, I think one of the most important things that I always mention is at the start of the draft, nominate the expensive players that you do not want. So uh, I'm not sure if you noticed, but when it was our turn to nominate here, we nominated Puka Nakua. The reason we nominated Puka Nakua is because we've said, all right, this is a guy that we think is overpriced. Uh, there's some other really good wide receivers that we like, things of that nature. Um, and he's a little bit banged up right now. So we're okay passing on Puka Nakua, but he's also going to fetch right around $40, which, which is a lot of money, right? And it's, it's going to deplete other people's funds. That is the point. Um, you want to nominate the players, the expensive players that you don't want early on, because that way somebody else will end up paying up for them. And then later on in the draft, uh, when let's say it's you and that person that spent up on that player you didn't want and potentially got them, 
um, bidding on a player that you actually do want, you are likely going to have an advantage in the bidding process because you're going to have more funds available, more money available, and um, you're going you're likely going to be able to win that bid. So that's why it's super important early on to force other players to spend their money. A lot of this, uh, you know, auction draft process is a psychological uh, game to it. Uh, forcing other people to spend, knowing when to nominate a certain player, knowing what strategy to use, knowing when to get out of a bidding war, um, and then just like knowing the tendencies of your league mates. These are all... Uh, things we're going to discuss, and this is why uh, I really personally like the auction draft process because it it is a little bit more psychological and a little bit more involved. But look, all right, we've talked the different strategies. We've talked what I think you know. It, it's a quick cover of just nominating expensive players. It's basic, but it's super super important. Let's move on to the next point. That is knowing your tiers. Uh, this is extremely important in the auction draft process. I mean, it's also important in the snake draft process, but in the auction draft, why that's important. Let's look at the cheat sheets here because this breaks it out on Fantasy Pros by tiers, right? And I think for the most part, it's pretty accurate. So the reason I bring this up is because let's say that it has gotten to the final name here of the tier two running backs, the way that they are ranked here on fantasy pros well what typically happens and you know if if you want if, if you're like all right i need a running back i need to get this last tier two guy uh because you've kind of ignored the running back position for example and and you still want to get a uh an upper echelon guy at that position look your league mates they're not blind to that either they realize that there is uh, a drop off in tiers. And if you don't realize that, if you're not keeping up with that fact, what's going to end up happening is you are going to end up paying a premium for uh, you know, for that last tier tiered player um and maybe you could have gotten somebody of the same ilk for a lot cheaper. The reason why that happens is because it creates that kind of artificial bidding war for a player. And uh, because of that scarcity that exists for that last tiered player, people are naturally going to uh, spend up more money on them. That's the way it happens. Again, that's, that's the psychology of it. People realize, oh, if I don't do this now, it's going to be too late. And um, it leads to uh, inflated bidding wars, inflated player prices, which is is one of those traps you do not want to fall into uh, during the auction draft process. That's why knowing the tiers, kind of having that list in your head or using a cheat sheet while you draft and having those tiers, you know, knowing which players you think are ranked a little bit too high, a little bit too low is always super helpful in the auction draft process because it's going to lead you to getting good values. It's going to help you avoid those inflated prices, all of those things. So for that reason, knowing the tiers, keeping up with the tiers uh, and where those players are is very, very useful. So let's move on here now uh, to our fourth point, and that is knowing which platform you are going to draft on during your actual draft day and then when you are getting your practice you're when you're doing all those mock drafts doing the majority of those mock drafts on that specific platform now i can't tell you how simple of an idea this is right on paper but at the same time it's one that i feel like a lot of people kind of neglect because all right let's say you're drafting on yahoo for example but then it's just easier for you to do those auction uh, uh, auction drafts on, let's say, Fantasy Pros or ESPN, and you really like the roster you put together on ESPN or Fantasy Pros. Um, that doesn't mean, folks, that you're going to be able to uh, put together the exact same roster by spending similar types of dollars on Yahoo on your actual uh, draft platform that you're using come draft day. Because just like a snake format, the pricings 
for certain players are different from platform to platform. Again, that's just akin to the rankings being different from platform to platform. Um, so that, again, ties back into uh, being able to identify where certain players are priced, where they're ranked, uh, so you know where those uh, discrepancies are, so you can take advantage of it. And then, again, by doing the majority of your uh, auction drafts on the specific platform you're going to use, that is the best way to prep for it because you more or less than... Uh, know the type of roster you can put together, how much money you're going to have to spend on certain positions on your starting roster. Um, and, you know, uh, basically how much money you're going to have left over uh, to play with. And, you know, you kind of draw up a pretty, for the most part, accurate blueprint. But now let's get into what I call the last piece or miscellaneous types of tips here uh, where these are more singular uh, quicker uh, to the point but still pretty important so uh, something that I always talk about budget management when it comes to the auction draft process it is all about budget management um, you want to again this ties back into the strategy you're using you want to be smart with your money uh, you don't want to spend all of it right away and then be left scratching your head what you're going to do for the remaining uh, uh, starting spots on your roster when you only have like 40 or 50 bucks left. Typically, you know, what I see is spending right around 70% of your budget on your starting uh, roster, uh, so not your bench, is more or less like a good starting point. So again, budget management, uh, not not getting into unnecessary bidding wars. There, obviously, there's always going to be situations where somebody is overpriced and somebody overpays for somebody, uh, something like that. But going, being extremely excessive, like paying ten dollars more for a certain player, I would say that's on the excessive side. Um, you know, typically like four or five dollars more than their recommended price. Like I get it. That's going to happen from time to time. So just keep that in mind. You don't want to get too aggressive. You don't want to get in too many bidding wars, things of that nature. Now, sure, sometimes you can just inflate the price of a player and punish your league mates for being a little bit too conservative because maybe they've ignored a certain position. And that way you can you, you can force them to pay up. Uh, a little bit more than they want. But again, uh, while that's smart, just don't fall in the trap of accidentally bidding too much and then you ending up with that player. Next, I want to talk about uh, you know nominating players that you want early on and just nominating those dark horses, those potential steals early on. I typically advise against this. The reason being is, again, it's all about psychology. During the start of the draft, that's when people have the most amount of money naturally, right? Typically around $200. Um, and because that's when they have the most amount of money, more often than not, the majority of times when people have the most amount of money, that's when they spend the most. Like if, if you nominate somebody that you really like and you think is a steal a little bit later on in the draft and people have already spent up a lot of their funds, like they're not going to be able to overbid that player as opposed to the start of the draft where, yeah, if they really want to, they can do that to you. They might not even want that player, but they may just want to spite you because they see that you nominate somebody that's a little bit lower down uh, the rankings, and they're like, all right, this must be somebody that they really want, uh, so I'm going to bid up, the, pro uh, bid up uh, the price, and if they want them, they're going to have to overpay for them. So that's why, more often than not, I say nominate those players that you really like that are later on types of guys later on when uh when some of that money has been spent up and uh you know again this comes down to uh, it's tied to budget management it's tied to uh just keeping track of the auction draft process itself now that's not to say that sometimes there uh it there isn't going to be a point where somebody is nominated and you know, it's a good value. There's always the one-offs. That's why you always have to, uh, I say this for the auction draft process, you always have to stay in tune. You have to stay um, it, like in the moment and be involved in every single nomination. And you have to keep track of, 
your league mates, their roster, the way the way it's setting up, because that's going to give you a little bit of a one up on them during the uh, in uh, the, the live drafting process. So you can kind of predict their tendencies. But again, that's probably a little bit more involved, uh, a little bit more advanced of a strategy. So if, if you don't do that uh, always or at the start, don't worry about it. That's that's not that big uh, of a deal. Also, trying to identify certain league trends. If you're in an auction auction league that's been going on for several years, typically most platforms allow you to look at the um, you know the results from years prior, so you can see how much certain players went for. You can see whether your league really likes running backs, whether they really value quarterbacks or tight ends and things like that. And if if there hasn't been too much league turnover. For the most part, you can take away some of those tendencies and apply them to their to to your current draft. And then the final thing here that I want to mention is when it comes to the final uh, budget that you have left, the, that that final uh, dollar amount. Try to end the draft with right around like. I mean, max three, four dollars type of situation. The reason I say that is because, I mean, there's a possibility where, you know, you can finish the draft and you can have like ten dollars left over. That is the worst case scenario, because what that means is you left um, you left talent on the table. You could have gone ahead and maybe maybe you got a tier two running back. Well, if you spent just like three, four five dollars more. A lot of times that can be the difference between landing a tier two running back and a tier one running back. So ideally you want to minimize the amount of money that you have left at the end because that means you maximized on the drafting value. Uh, So also keep that in mind. But with that, we wrap up these, what I believe are key tips that you need to know in order to nominate, uh, to dominate your 2024 fantasy football auction draft. Again, knowing the different types of strategies, knowing uh, what type of players you want to nominate, knowing the tiers, practicing on the appropriate platform, those miscellaneous tips that we mentioned at the end. Hopefully, this was helpful for you guys. If it was, hit that like button, subscribe, give us a, give us a follow on Twitter at All Day Pixian to continue interacting with us there. Let us hear in the comment section any questions you guys might have. We'll do our best to answer them all. But in the meantime, we'll see you guys in future videos.